Tonight, we have in front of us uh, what I consider to be one of the most profound chapters in the New Testament. I, I think that tonight you're going to see in Ephesians chapter 3 some things that maybe you didn't even know were in the Bible. But it's all in here, and it's all wonderful, and it's all amazing for us to take in and to comprehend. But before I read Ephesians chapter 3, starting at verse 1, let me remind you just a little bit of what we've seen in the first two chapters thus far. In chapter 1, Paul, after introducing himself to the Ephesian church, he spoke of God's great work of redemption in man. And he spoke about it in terms of the work of the Father, the work of the Son, and then the work of the Holy Spirit. And then at the end of chapter 1, he prayed a beautiful and a profound prayer for the Ephesians that God would give them the spiritual ability to understand these tremendous truths about God's work in the life of the believer. Then into chapter 2, which we studied the last time we were together, Paul speaks about God's great work of reconciliation, both on an individual basis, he deals with the individual salvation of man, but then also God's work of reconciliation between the two great divided groups in the world at that time, Jew and Gentile, and how God had this amazing plan to bring together Jew and Gentile into one group. He concluded the second chapter with this idea of God building a great building with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone and the foundation being the apostles and the prophets and then being built upon it, well, you and I, God's people together, Jew, Gentile, from every tongue, every nation, every uh, part of the world, every economic class, every region, every race, you could go on and on. From, from all different kinds of people, God is building together a glorious building, a temple, so to speak, to the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. So after explaining this great comprehensive work of reconciliation and redemption, both on an individual basis and on the basis of how God will reconcile groups of people, now Paul begins chapter 3, verse 1. He says, for this reason. In other words, in light of all that tremendous work of reconciliation that, that he's spoken of. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. And I love how in my particular translation, the New King James translation, how verse 5 ends with a colon. It ends with a, with a statement that says, okay, I'm going to explain to you what comes next, what this great mystery is. Now, there's a lot in these first five verses. Let's sort of go through and, and take it phrase by phrase and understand what Paul's saying, because actually what he's doing in these first five verses is he's putting us right on the edge of our seat. He's putting us in a place of great anticipation for what he's going to say next. So let's see how he does it. First of all, he says, for this reason, in other words, in light, as I said before, of, of that great work of reconciliation, which I spoke of in chapters one and two, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. I just have to stop right there. I, it's fascinating to think of two things. First of all, Paul wrote this letter, this soaring, high-minded, in the heavenlies letter, he wrote it from prison. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you, you would almost expect Paul to be focused on his own trials, on his own tribulations. You, you, you would never suspect until he mentions it there in, in verse 1 of chapter 3 that Paul has any kind of hardship. You would think that he wrote this from the most beautiful alpine village, you know, with the waterfall and the glacier and the snow and the birds are singing. It looks like a scene from Heidi out there, you know, just beautiful in every aspect. He's writing this from a Roman prison, which, which really convicts us about the way we often complain about our circumstances and choose to blame our misery on our circumstances, right? Well, I can't be lifted up in my mind to the 
heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Look how terrible my circumstances are. And then we think of Paul writing this letter in a Roman prison. But then I like what he says as well here. He says, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Wait a minute, just for a moment there. I thought Paul was a prisoner of Rome. But you know what? Paul realized that Jesus Christ was the Lord of his life, not the Roman government. If Paul was a prisoner, well then, good heavens, he was the prisoner of Jesus Christ, wasn't he? Now, he looked outside of his cell. Actually, I, I don't want to... Paul was probably not in a prison cell here. He was probably under house arrest which means that most of the time, maybe not all the time, but most of the time he was chained, but he could live at his own house and receive guests. But he was imprisoned, but probably not in a, in a, in a you know, horrible jail cell. But he had guards around him. He had chains. It was definitely an imprisonment. Well, listen, he wasn't chained to Jesus Christ. <laughs> I mean, there were Roman soldiers all around. Yet Paul could say, I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. You know, the same thing applies to our life. You, you, you work at a job. Your boss isn't your boss. Your boss is Jesus Christ. You, you, you're a parent. You're not a parent for your children. You're a parent for Jesus Christ. You're a student. You're not a student for your teachers. You're a student for Jesus Christ. Whatever we do, whatever we are, we do it unto the glory of the Lord. But then he says, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. Understand this, and this is going to be important for you to understand the rest of the chapter. The reason why Paul was under arrest, awaiting trial, was because of his missionary efforts on behalf of the Gentiles. This gets back to Paul's whole Roman imprisonment, as it's described in the second half of the book of Acts, when he was arrested in Rome, excuse me, in Jerusalem, and then his journey all the way to Rome where he awaited arrest. Paul is going to explain to us an incredibly profound truth about the Gentiles in the coming verses. What I want you to understand from this verse is that Paul suffered for the very truth that he's going to explain to us in a few moments. Now, Paul isn't writing this so that we'll feel sorry for him. He wanted his readers to realize that it was a benefit for them that he was imprisoned. You know, Paul lived such a busy, active life. I think that one of the few times that he could really sit back and think deeply about these great things and these majestic truths of the gospel was when he was imprisoned. It's like God said, you know, uh, Paul needs to take a writing sabbatical, so let's throw him into jail for a few years. I, I don't I don't want to get ahead of myself, but he, he goes on here, uh, verse uh, 1 and 2. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. Now, Paul's saying, you've heard about something that was given to me for you. And what was that thing? He mentions it here in verse three, or excuse me, in verse two, the dispensation of the grace of God. Now, do you know what a dispensation is? It's sort of a difficult word. You do know what a dispenser is, right? Think of it like a soft drink or a soda dispenser, right? What do you get out of it? What does a soda dispenser do? Well, it dispenses soda. You go and you get, you know, the drink that you want from it, the beverage you want from it. There you pull the tap and whatever it comes out. It's a dispenser. Now, a dispensation is a portion of something. So something was given to Paul, a portion of something, a portion of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. Now, that's sort of the basic idea behind the English word. The ancient Greek word that's used here in this context has a slightly different connotation. This is what I want you to understand by this. The, the, the ancient Greek word probably has the idea here of an implemented strategy. Now, you can think of a strategy as being a portion of something, a plan. It's like a package. Well, this was the package or the plan or the implemented strategy that God had for Paul. It's really the idea of the apostolic office and gifts that were given to Paul, all wrapped up in the divine plan. 
God delivered to me a package, a plan. Well, what's in the package? Well, it's the calling and gifts that Paul had as an apostle. It's the plan that God had for him. Okay, so God gave this to Paul. This dispensation of the grace of God was given to Paul for what? For the Gentiles, as it says there in verse 2. And then he goes on here, verse 3, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I've briefly written already, he says, okay, now notice this. Something was revealed to Paul, right? That's what it says in verse 3. That by revelation, something was revealed to Paul. You know what he's assuring the, the Ephesians here? He's assuring them and he's assuring us of this, that I'm not making this up. This isn't my own clever idea. I, I didn't sit down in a room and think real hard and think this up. This was given to me by a revelation, and then if to emphasize it, he says in verse 3, how that by revelation, he made known to me the mystery. Now, you need to understand the idea of mystery in the ancient Greek language, because it's different from our modern understanding of the idea of mystery. In the ancient Greek language, the word mystery or mysterion was used for something that wasn't necessarily hidden. Okay, if I go uh, hide an Easter egg and I hide it somewhere in this room, you know, and it's like I say, okay, everybody, where's the Easter egg? And you go looking for it and you go looking for it and nobody can find it. And then finally I say, well, the Easter egg is behind that bookcase. And oh, well, now we can find it. And we go get the Easter egg and somebody holds it up. Now, the placement of that Easter egg, was it a mystery before anybody knew where it was? Yes. Was it a mystery after I told everybody where it was? In the ancient Greek understanding of the word, yes, it is. Because a mystery in the ancient Greek understanding isn't something that's unknown. It's something that can only be known by revelation. In other words, you might know what it is. You might know where the Easter egg is. Then what makes it a mystery? What makes it a mystery is that you wouldn't have known unless I told you it. The only way you could ever know is that I told you it was there. Therefore, you can know it, but it still remains a mystery because you could not have known it unless it was revealed to you. And so Paul says, he made known to me the mystery. And so we're all on the edge of our seat. Paul, what, what is this mystery? What, what are you trying to tell to us? Now, he tells us something about this mystery beginning here at verse 3. He says, as I've briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And we say, okay, great. What, what is this mystery, Paul? He says, okay, let me tell you a little more about it here in verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. And now we're almost falling off our chair. We're so much, well, tell us what it is. There's some great mystery that God has revealed to Paul. That, that now it's been revealed and everybody can know what it is, but, but nobody could know what it was unless God revealed it to him. And now he's going to tell us what this great mystery is. Well, Paul, tell us, please, what is it now? Take a look at verse 6. This is the great mystery. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel of which I became a minister according to the gift of grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Well, this describes the mystery itself. That believing Jews and believing Gentiles are joined together into one body of Christ, into one church, and they're no longer separated before God as such. In other words, when God creates the church, he doesn't say, oh, I'm going to take the Gentiles and make them Jewish. Nor does he say, I'm going to take the Jews and make them Gentiles. God says, no, I'm going to make a brand new body, some of the Jews, some of the Gentiles, and bring them together into one brand new thing. And I want you to notice this. Paul says about this very plainly in verse 5, that it was not made known to the sons of men. In other words, 
You can scour the pages of the Old Testament and you will not find that this was God's plan. God didn't reveal this to us until the time of the apostles and prophets. He didn't prophesy about this ahead of time. God did not prophesy that he would bring Jew and Gentile together into one body. This was something new that he revealed through the apostles and prophets. And the truth of this mystery is that the Gentiles are now, as it says here in verse 6, partakers of his promises in Christ. This is no longer a privilege reserved only for the believing Jewish person, but rather the Gentile can now be a partaker in the promise of the Messiah. How? Through the gospel. Look at it right there at the end of verse 6. That's how it happens. All men have an equal standing in Jesus through the gospel. It's not through circumcision. It's not through another ceremony. It's not through becoming a Gentile or becoming a Jew. No, it's through the gospel. And so Paul says, this is the great mystery. God did something completely new with the church, something that he didn't even announce ahead of time. Now, you can imagine what a shock this was to the Jewish people in Paul's day. Now, there was a lot of racial animosity between Jew and Gentile in the first century on both sides. Many of the Gentiles hated the Jews, and many of the Jews hated the Gentiles. But yet, there were many Jews, we would hope, in the days of Jesus, in the days of the first century, who understood God's plan of the ages in the Old Testament, and understood that God wanted to reach out to the the Gentile nations through the Jewish people, that his plan of salvation didn't end with the Jewish people. But even those, even the people, the Jewish people who had a big heart for the Gentiles in the first century, they never suspected that God would bring the Gentiles into his kingdom this way. They thought that if God were to bring the Gentiles into the kingdom, he would bring them into the kingdom by making them Jews. I mean, isn't that how you would do it? By the way, this was the whole debate in Acts chapter 15, that famous Jerusalem council, where there was just a huge debate in the early church. When Gentiles started coming to faith in Christ over and over again, many Jewish believers, honest, sincere Christians said, well, we love for our Gentile brothers to come to Christ, but don't they have to become Jews first? Isn't that how it has to work? First, you have to become a Jew. Then you can put your trust in the Messiah. And it was a big issue. And they discussed it all at the Jerusalem Council. And they rightly sensed from the word of God and the spirit of God that no, no, no. God is doing something new now in the church where no longer does a Gentile have to become a Jew in order to come to God. But God is making a new party, a new group. Are they Jews? No. Are they Gentiles? No. They're the church, the body of Christ. You know, in the early church, the first century Christians, they had a saying. They would say, we are a third race. We're not Jews. We're not Gentiles. We are a third race. We're Christians. And you see, this is something glorious that was not announced. And Paul now, in verses 8 and 9, speaks of the fact that he was given the privilege of presenting this mystery. Look at it here in verse 8. He says, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make, see, uh, to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. You know, when... Paul begins there in verse 8 and speaks uh, of the fact that he is less than the least of all the saints. He's marveling at the grace that was given to him. He's amazed that he was called to preach the gospel that makes this mystery a reality. And, and you know, when you think of Paul's personal history, when you think of his testimony, this calling really was all of grace, that he should be the one who's a preacher. And by the way, the word preach there uh, in verse 8, it just literally means to announce good news. That's what Paul did. 
know, if you think of a preacher, go on fact, you know, the preacher voice, and you know, the whole preacher stereotype, that word to preach in the ancient Greek language, it just means to announce good news. Paul was just saying, let me tell you the good things that Jesus has done. That's all his preaching was. And what was the good news? Notice it here in verses 8 and 9. He says, verse 8, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. This mystery is like great riches for the Gentiles. They can now come before God in a standing they could only dream of before. I like how he says the unsearchable riches of Christ. I think of Paul, you know, as if he's a hiker, you know, he's hiking out in the wilderness and then he comes upon a body of water. You know, he looks around and he thinks it's a lake and he says, well, I'm going to search out the parameters of this lake. You know, let me figure out how big this lake is. And so he starts to, to hike along the shore as if he's tracking the shore of a lake. But soon he discovers, you know, this isn't a lake at all. I've come to the Pacific Ocean. It's an immeasurable sea. I tried to search out the boundaries of this body of water that I see before you, and I see now that it's unsearchable. God's riches are unsearchable. You'll never know them completely. And that's what Paul was looking out on the ocean of God's grace. And he says, listen, this, this is what man needs to see. He needs to see the infinite, the enormous grace of God. Now, he says in verse 9, and to make all see, this is what he wanted to do through his preaching, to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. In other words, God entrusted Paul with these great riches. Here are the unsearchable riches of his grace, and it's just like these unsearchable riches of his grace. God took a portion of them, took a dispensation of them, right? Took took a portion of them, put it in a bag, and he said to Paul, here it is. I want you to go spread this around among the Gentiles. I want you to use this to make it known to the Gentiles all that I've done to them. And so his passion was to make this gospel known to all people, to make all see what is the fellowship of this mystery. He wanted everybody to see it and to share in the fellowship of this mystery. And again, it's a mystery precisely because it was unknown and unknowable until God revealed it. God God didn't pre-announce this in any way. I have to say, I just like that phrase that's used there in verse 9. The fellowship of the mystery carefully consider what that phrase means. It demonstrates that these are not only theological facts to know, but it's a life to live, to to be united in Jesus with other believers without any separation such as existed between Jew and Gentile. That's a life to live. You know, I think of some poor man. He knows the facts of the mystery, doesn't he? Well, yes, you know, I can spell out to you the theological ramifications of the mystery of God. And, you know, what this theologian, that theologian, what the scholastic medieval theologian said about it, you know, he writes it all, and he knows all the facts about the mystery, but you want to go up to him and pat him on the shoulder. Brother, do you know the fellowship of the mystery? Is your life actually connecting with another brother or sister in Jesus Christ over this glorious fellowship of the mystery? God has joined us together into one body, one out of Jew, out of Gentile, out of slave, out of free, out of rich, out of poor, out of black, out of white, out of any kind of thing you want to say, God has joined us together into one body. And this is something that you experience in life, not just know about in your head. It's the fellowship of the mystery. And then when he explains it more in verse 9, he says, listen, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God. Right, He's amplifying the point that he made before. From the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Now, it it was revealed later. It was revealed after the finished work of Jesus on the cross. But you know what I love about this? It, It tells us that there was something new in the new covenant. There was something, just a a mystery revealed that nobody could figure out before. It's wrong to consider the, the, the uh, Israel, the Old Testament church, and the church, the New Testament Israel. No, there's something new in the new covenant. That, that in the body of Christ, there's something that God did brand new that he didn't say anything about before. And then we come to verse 10. Now, I, I'm going to ask you to just sort of gather up all your attention right now. Because when we come to verse 10, I I think we're climbing just about as high as you can climb. The air is kind of thin up here. If you had an oxygen mask and an oxygen tank, you should put it on right about here. Because here, Paul is just going to begin to blow your mind. 
Okay, re- remember how he started in chapter three, he first started telling us what the mystery was, right? That God was bringing together Jew and Gentile into one thing. And then he started talking about his participation. In, yes, God has given me to preach this mystery. I'm an apostle. He's given me a dispensation of grace to, to preach these unsearchable riches. That, that's my job here. And now in verses 10, 11, and 12, he's going to tell you the purpose of this mystery. God, why did you do it this way? You know what? Why didn't you announce it before? Why did you join together one body? Why didn't you just do it through the Jews? Why? What's the purpose? Here it is. Ready? To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. All right, we got the air's thin up here. We got to take this apart phrase by phrase. What's the purpose? Okay, first, that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. Okay. We begin with a premise here. It's an entirely biblical premise that God is a being of infinite wisdom and glory. And he wants his creatures to know his great and manifold wisdom. Do you know what manifold means? It means many faceted. Think of a gemstone, you know, a beautiful diamond that's cut, you know, like a, uh, an engagement or a wedding ring. And it's got many facets, many different angles to it. And you could look at it from all these different angles. That's what, uh, that's what this word manifold means. There are many different angles and surfaces and aspects to the wisdom of God. One purpose in God's great plan of the ages, is to reveal this wisdom. Now, understanding the character of God, we can say that this is not a selfish or a self-glorying motive in the way that we think of a proud man showing off his brains and his accomplishments to everyone. I I mean, you, you could almost get that wrong impression here, couldn't you? What if I were to tell you that, you know, the, the, the reason why um, I'm doing this study here on Tuesday evenings is so that my manifold wisdom might be revealed to everybody. You'd think, gee, what a arrogant jerk. You know, you think, what, who does he think he is? You know, he's just looking for some, well, so everybody can know how smart I am, you know, that kind of thing. No, 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 that's not God's purpose at all. God does this for the good and for the glory of his creatures. Because the glory of the creature is directly connected to the glory of the creator. The more we perceive how wonderful he is, the more we understand our place in his great plan. And so it must be made known to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God By the way, I love what Dean Alford, a great ancient Greek commentator, says about this, where it says that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. He says, no, that's very emphatic. You should translate it that it must be made known. It's very strongly contrasting with the idea of hidden in verse 9. No, no, no. This must be made known right here. What's going to be made known? The manifold wisdom of God is going to be made known, right? Well, who's going to make it known? He tells you right here in verse 10. By the church to the principalities and powers. This explains to us how God will reveal his wisdom and to whom he will reveal it. He will reveal it by his work in the church. And who will he reveal it to? You might think, well, he's going to reveal it to us, right? Isn't that what this is all about? Revealing his wisdom to us? No, get off of centering everything on yourself for a moment and understand this. God is doing this so that he can reveal his manifold wisdom to angelic beings. So wait, where do you get angelic beings here? Look at it, it says, to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Listen, those are terms used several times in the New Testament for angelic beings. You know that, don't you? You know it from the Ephesians 6 spiritual warfare passage that says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and spiritual forces of wickedness in high places so you understand this right 
We are talking about angelic beings, some of them faithful, some of them fallen, but they're angelic beings. And so I'm encompassing both faithful and fallen angelic beings. This is what God is revealing his wisdom to. Now, of course, God also wants to reveal this wisdom to the church, but I find it fascinating. That in the big picture, God doesn't use his angels to reveal his wisdom to the saints. But he uses the saints to reveal his wisdom to angelic beings. This reminds us that we're called to something far greater than our own individual salvation and sanctification. You are called to be the way by which God teaches the universe a lesson. And it's a beautiful lesson at that. You know, we're, we're surrounded. We're surrounded here tonight by invisible spiritual beings, and they intently look upon us. Here, it's as if Paul is drawing back an invisible curtain, and, and, and uh, the invisible curtain hides these spiritual beings. And Paul's saying, I'm going to pull back the curtain for a minute and let you see there are angelic beings all around us, and they're looking at what they're doing, and God's work in us is teaching them about his wisdom. You say, well, what? What what possibly do angels have to learn from us? Well, listen, whatever it is they learn, they're learning those lessons intently. They see in us all of our weakness. They see in us all of our sin. I I know that you give off to everybody else that impression that you got it all together and things are all... Do you think the angels that see your every move, do you think they have any doubt about how weak your life really is? They see our weakness. They see our sin. They see within us a nature that has been utterly wrecked by the fall and by sin, but is yet made in the image of God. And they see God at work in that person, as weak and as sinful as they sometimes still are. And they say, oh Lord, I know how weak they are. That you can use them certainly shows your manifold wisdom. You see, Sometimes Christians get the crazy idea that God saved them and God works in their life because they are somehow such great people. You know, the angels see through that immediately. They know that it's not because of us. Sometimes we think it is, but the angels know. We we may think our lives are small and insignificant. The angels know better than that. We may doubt our place of high standing and identification to heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Listen, the angels see that spiritual reality with eyes wide open. It's like this. It's as if a great drama is being enacted. History is the theater. The world is the stage. And God's people, church members in every land are the actors. God has written the play and he directs it and produces it. Act by act, scene by scene, the story continues to unfold. But who's the audience? They are the cosmic intelligences, the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Those are basically the words of John Stott, who has a wonderful commentary on the book of Ephesians. And I like that picture. Here we are. You're an actor on a stage, and you look out on the audience, and who it is? It's a bunch of angelic beings. As I said before, faithful and fallen as well. There's some faithful angels out there. There's fallen angels out there. But the bottom line is this, is that the angels are instructed in God's wisdom by what God is doing in his people. I find it amazing, this thought, that the angels are interested and instructed by the lives of Christians. I think. We should really wake up to that fact and realize that the conduct of our Christian life matters more than to just ourself. How easy it is for a Christian to justify or to accommodate sin in their own life by this one, right? Don't don't raise your hand if you recognize this because we don't need every hand raised here. I'm only hurting myself. I know this is sin but I'm I'm not damaging anybody else. I'm just hurting myself. Oh, no, you're not. Now, I could probably explain to you many ways that you're damaging other people, but let me just say this. I think you're blowing your witness before the angels. 
I mean, God is using them, using you, I should say, to teach them something. Well, what are they learning? Like what Charles Spurgeon said here. He said, and lastly, what think some of you, what would angels say of your walk and conversation? Well, I suppose you don't care much about them, and yet you should. For who but angels will be the reapers at the last? And who but they shall be the way that were carried across to the dark stream? Who but they shall carry our spirits like that of Lazarus into the Father's bosom? Surely we should not despise them. You know, the Bible talks about that. Now, I don't want to make some kind of spiritual law here, but there are a few mentions in the Bible of angels carrying people from this world to the next. I don't want to make it some kind of spiritual law, but I can't deny it. The scriptures mention this a few times. Angels carrying people from this world to the next. And I just think, you teach the angels a bad lesson. Well, he might give you a rough trip between here and heaven, right? Might bang your head a few times on a few things, right? Say, well, what kind of lesson? You didn't show me what you should have showed me about God's love, about God's faithfulness, about God's holiness. See, this is a beautiful, beautiful thing. That God has given us such a high place, such a high calling, that he uses us as individuals and corporately as the church to teach angels. Going on here, verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished. The mystery reveals and furthers God's eternal purpose in Jesus. Now, he previously spoke about this eternal purpose back in Ephesians chapter 1, Verse 10, do you remember that verse where we spoke about God summing up, adding everything up in Jesus, that this was his his eternal purpose? And this is furthering this idea that God will gather together or sum up or resolve all things in Jesus. The mystery of the unified body of Christ is according to that purpose of God adding up or resolving everything in Jesus. It's a preview of what Jesus will ultimately do in the fulfillment of summing up all things into himself. Let me put it to you this way. You know, let's say that you, you want to launch a great business operation, right? You, you want to launch a, some new great, you know, business venture. Nationwide, right? Big, big business venture. And you go to some people, man, I got this plan for a great business. You know, you, you should see my plan, boy, this will really work. What do they want you to do before they invest their money in your big venture? They say, Why don't you try it on a small scale first somewhere, right? Why don't you try a pilot program? That's what you would call it, wouldn't it? It's a pilot program. It's a preview. Show us how you can do it in one situation. Make it work in this one city first, and then you can take it nationwide. Well, listen, God has an eternal plan for all of the ages, but what he's doing right now in the church, this is his pilot program. Saying, I'm going to resolve all things together in Christ in the church, and then you're going to see how I can make it all sum up together in Jesus ultimately. And I have to say, Paul speaks with such confidence in verse 11. Did you notice that? He says, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus. As far as Paul is concerned, it's already done, right? Now, I think if you were to quiz Paul, you'd say, well, Paul, Paul, do you really mean that it's already finished, that there's nothing more for God to do in working out this eternal purpose? Because no, 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 I, th- there's more for God to do. But as far as God's concerned, it's done. It's finished. You know, th- this plan is not going to fail. And how? He goes on here, verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. The fact of this unity between Jew and Gentile is shown by the truth that both Jew and Gentile collectively have the identical boldness and access and confidence before God. It has nothing to do with national or ethnic identity, only with faith in him. You see, this is wonderful. The same access. You, You can make a great sermon there out of verse 12. Boldness, access, confidence. In Jesus Christ, Everybody has the same. You know, the divisions in the church haven't always been between Jew and Gentile. The the, the reformers spoke out against the division between clergy and laity. And sometimes people get this idea of a divided Christian world between clergy and laity. Let me tell you something. I don't care if it's clergy. I don't care if it's laity. I don't care what you... They have the same boldness. They have the same confidence. They have the same access because it's all by faith in Jesus Christ. 
you start thinking that the clergy or the pastor or the minister is closer to God than you are, you don't know how mistaken you are. The same boldness, the same confidence, the same access, it's because we all have it by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, considering all that, when we get to verse 13, I think it's just astounding. All right, you got to admit, through these first 12 verses, I mean, Paul has just been out on the mountaintop, right? Now, forget the mountaintop. You know, he's launched up into a rocket. You know, he's probably past the moon by now. He's in the heavenlies. But he's out there. It's like, oh, Paul, that's amazing. Eternal purpose, fellowship of the mystery, principalities and powers. It's like, wow, Paul. And then look how he brings it back down here in verse 13. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. You know what I hear in the echo of verse 13? I hear the the clattering of Paul's chains. Can't you hear that? Right when he says that word tribulations, can't you hear Paul shaking his chains a little bit? He goes, you know, in light of this great eternal purpose, this, this fellowship of the mystery, this eternal plan, I ask that you do not lose heart. I'm under arrest for the sake of the gospel, but don't you lose heart for me. He says, my tribulations there for you. And these tribulations that Paul was suffering, they really were for them, for those Gentile Christians. Paul was imprisoned in Rome, waiting for his trial before Caesar, and he was there because God wanted Gentiles to share in the good news of the Messiah. And Paul wasn't afraid to preach that truth. That's why he was there. And so he says, listen, you know, when you think about my imprisonment, think about the fact that I'm still participating in this great eternal purpose, this high plan that God has, this fellowship of the mystery. Don't lose heart at my chains. And you can understand why they might think that way. Well, listen, if Paul's gospel is so great, if Paul's God is so wonderful, if there's so much spiritual power in the life of Paul, then why is he in prison? But why doesn't God set him free? I heard God set him free before. Didn't God set him free at Philippi? Well, why doesn't God set Paul free again? Why is he in prison? And by the way, at this time, Paul had been in prison for a good three years. Well, well, why is Paul in protective custody? Why is he hindered? And why can't he do his missionary thing for the last three years if God is so powerful? It's no, 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 Paul says, don't you lose heart. Well, God knows exactly what he's doing, even with my imprisonment. I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And this imprisonment, look at it there. Verse 13, I couldn't make this up. It's so fantastic. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. No, Paul, what are you talking about? Our glory. I mean, look, okay, we can handle it that you're in prison, right? We're not happy about it, though. You wanted me to glory in it? And Paul says, yes, absolutely. Because I am being used, and I'm probably being used in a greater way than you can ever imagine. You know, he was. He really was. This really was the glory. Because you know what came forward from this imprisonment of Paul's? How about a little letter called Ephesians? How about another letter called Colossians? How about a third letter called Philippians? And a fourth one called Philemon? They certainly all have their place in God's eternal plan. Now now you say, this is for your glory, Lord. It really is. Now now we just don't have to look at Paul's imprisonment and say, oh, well, oh, I guess, Lord, I, okay, God, you know, whatever, Lord, somehow I'll still trust you through this dark night of the soul, whatever, God. No, you say, well, Lord, if you're doing it, and I know Paul loves you, and he's your apostle, you must have a glorious purpose in this, and I'm going to glory in the same manner, I want you to know, just as much as Paul had a place in God's eternal plan, so do you. And when you know your place in God's eternal plan, when you, when you know, maybe not in exact terms, maybe none of us know in exact terms, but you have some sense of knowledge that you're fitting into God's eternal plan and God's eternal purpose, then man, that's a great guard against losing heart in the midst of tribulation. Well, those first 13 verses, that's just... That's high, high, soaring stuff. But now, beginning at verse 14 to the end of the chapter, Paul is going to pray. You know, it's as if he can't talk about these high and lofty themes without being moved to prayer. And so now he's going to pray. Verse 14 and 15. 
For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. It's for this reason. This was the basis of Paul's prayer, his knowledge of God's purpose. Listen, I know God's in control. I know that my imprisonment is even for the glory of God. For all this reason, it's all working out according to his eternal plan, his eternal purpose. For this reason, I bow my knees. Can I ask you a question? When's the last time you bowed your knees in prayer? Paul prayed in the posture of bowing his knees. You know, this was not the common posture for prayer in this culture. The, the common posture for prayer in Paul's Hebraic culture, the culture he grew up in, was not kneeling. The common posture of prayer was to stand with your hands raised to heaven. That was the common posture of prayer. You know, we, we tend to maybe sit and fold our hands. This is kind of our cultural posture of prayer. Paul was not adopting his cultural posture of prayer. He was saying, I get down on my knees before God. I'm humbling myself before him. And listen, that, that humility comes in when he considers how great God's eternal plan was and how he had a place in that plan and how God's work was unstoppable even when Paul was imprisoned. Listen, the, the God who can shine his glory through an apostle who's in prison, that's a God you should get down on your knees before. And so I, I just want to tell you, we should be doing this sometime. I don't know when it is, but it, it's good for us sometimes to get down on our knees and pray. Solomon prayed on his knees. Ezra prayed on his knees. The psalmist prayed on his knees. Daniel prayed on his knees. People came kneeling to Jesus. Stephen prayed on his knees. Peter prayed on his knees. Paul prayed on his knees. Early Christians prayed on their knees. And most importantly, Jesus prayed on his knees. Now, the Bible has enough prayer that is not upon the knees to show us that it's not required, right? But it also has enough prayer that is on the knees to show us that it's good. And so he says, I get down on my knees, verse 15, excuse me, verse 14, to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. You see, in remembering that all God's family is called after his name, Paul showed that his mind was rather taken by this idea of the essential unity of the body of Christ. God was the father of both Jew and Gentile. Charles Spurgeon preached a touching sermon on this text. It was titled, Saints in Heaven and Earth one family. It's a beautiful sermon. In that message, he developed the idea that we are one with our brothers and sisters in heaven. I mean, that's what Paul's saying there. Look at it again in verse 15. In whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We're all named. Those brothers and sisters that we have in heaven, we are still in one body with them. I have to say, doesn't that make heaven more precious to us? To know those people that we will see when we go there. Okay, now he's going to get here and start asking for some things, starting at verse 16. Are you ready here? Verse 16 through 19. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the depth and the height, to, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. There, there's a lot in four verses right there. First, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Again, is that a big measure or, or a small measure? You know, when God is measuring things out according to the riches of his glory, is that, is that a little scoop about the size of a thimble? Or is that a big scoop, you know, about as big as a blue whale or something like that? I don't know. So it's using a big measure here, right? That according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. I love that prayer. You know, that's a prayer I pray for myself and I pray for other people as well, that they would be strengthened with might and that that strength would be put through the Holy Spirit into their inner man. Let me tell you something. There is an inner man that is just as real as our physical body. 
Now, we all understand how important it is to have some measure of strength in your physical body, right? If you didn't have any strength in your physical body, you couldn't sit here and listen. You couldn't even sit up in a chair, right? You, you need strength in your physical body. And you know what it's like when you feel strong and when you feel weak in your physical body. Well, let me tell you, there is an inner man that is just as real as your physical man. And what would it be like right now if your physical body displayed the same level of strength that your inner man has? Maybe some people would be falling out of their chairs right now, right? No strength to even stand up. But it's funny, we can hide that in the inner man, can't we? Now listen, many people are exceedingly weak in the inner man. Paul says, no, I pray that you would be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That's the first prayer. Next prayer, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Is that pretty simple there? That Jesus would live in your heart. That's what I'm asking for, Lord. Lord, I pray that Jesus would live in their heart through faith. This is really just fulfilling the prayer that Jesus promised in, in, in John 14, 23. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. You know, when he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, he's using a specific ancient Greek word. Now, there were two ancient Greek words to convey the idea to live in. One had the idea of living in a place as a stranger, and the other had the idea of settling down in a place to make it your permanent home. Guess which one he uses here? He wants Jesus to dwell in your heart, not as a stranger, but is as a permanent resident. And so he says, hey, that Christ would live in your heart, dwell in your heart through faith. That's the second glorious, mighty prayer that he prays. Next, notice it again. Being rooted and grounded in love. That's the third thing that Paul prayed for. He asked that all of this would take place as they were rooted and grounded in love. The meaning seems to be that they should be rooted and grounded in their love for one another. This has to do more than, than with our love for God, but really the love we have for one another. And so he says, listen, with all this spiritual strength that you have, with, with all this, this dwelling of Christ in your heart by faith, oh, you also have to be rooted and ground with love for another. Doesn't that give us a good corrective there? Don't, don't sometimes we get into this attitude, or at least we meet people who have this attitude. You know, I am so right with God. Mm, me and God were this close. It's just I can't get along with anybody else. Oh, but me and God, no problem there. Don't sometimes people want to act like that? Well, you know, that, that doesn't work. That doesn't go anywhere in the Christian life. In the Christian life, we're told that if we have fellowship with God, we have fellowship one with another. And so it's not enough for a person, yes, I'm strong in the inner man. Yes, Jesus lives in my heart. It's like, no, I better be rooted and grounded in love for other people together. And then he goes on the next part. He says, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints. There's something I want you to gather to understand with all the saints, not just you yourself. Isn't that amazing how Paul comes back again and again and again in this to this idea of the body, of community, of the life that we live one with another, of this new society that God is building, this community of Jesus Christ, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints. And here it just, it just goes, I don't know if you call this poetry. I don't know if you call this a hymn. I don't know what, but it's just, I'll just read it. What is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The width and length and depth and height. You know what this tells us? It tells us that the love of Jesus has dimensions and it can be measured. You know, that the, the, the love of Jesus is solid. It has dimensions and it can be measured. I, I, again, I, I just have to quote Spurgeon here. He says, alas, to a great many religious people, the love of Jesus is not a solid, substantial thing at all. It's a beautiful fiction or a sentimental belief or a formal theory, but to Paul, it was real, substantial, 
It was a measurable fact. And he considered it this way and that way and the other way. And it was evidently real to him, whatever it might be to others. You see, the love of Jesus has width. You know, you can see how wide a river is by noticing how much it covers over, right? Well, God's river of love is so wide that it covers over my sin and it covers over every circumstance of my life so that all things work together for good. When I doubt his forgiveness, when I doubt his providence, I'm narrowing the mighty river of God's love. His love is as wide as the world. For God so loved the world, it's wide. And then you think of the length of God's love. When you consider the length of God's love, ask yourself, when did the love of God start towards you? And how long will it continue? You know, those truths measure the length of God's love. Jeremiah 31, 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's how long it is. You know, the love of Jesus has depth too. Not just width, not just length, it has depth. Philippians chapter two, verses seven and eight tells us how deep the love of Jesus goes. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You can't go lower than the death of the cross. And that's how deep the love of Jesus is for us. And then finally, you'd have to say that the love of Jesus, it has height, doesn't it? It has width. It has length. It has depth. Oh, but it also has height. To see the height of God's love, ask yourself, how high does it lift me? It lifts me up to heavenly places where I am seated with Christ Jesus. He's raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So listen, can we really comprehend the width and the length and the depth and the height of God's love? I think if you're going to comprehend Any understanding of the dimensions of God's love, you got to go to the cross. And the cross, look at it right there, just picture it in your mind. The cross is pointing in four directions, right? There it is, the the, the two beams of the cross pointing out in four different directions. It's wide enough to include every person. It's long enough to last throughout all eternity. It's deep enough to reach the worst sinner. And it's high enough to take us to heaven. These are the dimensions of God's love. Paul continues on here. If you notice, as he puts it there in verse 19, to know the love of Christ. Paul wrote of something we can know. It isn't speculation or guesswork or emotions or feelings. It's something to know. My heart goes out. I, I have not the slightest note of condemnation but only a, a, a sense of, of, uh, of empathy and pity for, for Christians who don't know this love of Christ, who feel that the love of Christ is distant from them. But no, as Paul prayed, you should make this prayer for yourself. Say, Lord, Paul prayed this for the Ephesians. Jesus, would you please pray this in heaven for me, that I would know your love. And then as he says in verse 19, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, there's really a better translation than what you read right here in the New King James Version. Let me read to you the better translation. That you may be filled unto all the fullness of God. Paul wanted the Christians to experience life in Jesus, the fullness of God, and to be filled to their capacity with Jesus. You know, God is filled to his own capacity with his own character and love. Well, God wants us to be filled to our capacity with his love. So at the end of all of this, we conclude the chapter tonight with these last two verses. I mean, what else would you do but just like, well, you just praise God after this, right? What else can you do? You you give a doxology, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. You know, as Paul came to this great height, and by the way, if you look at the end of verse 19, how, how much bigger can you get than the fullness of God? 
I, 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 you, you, your mind can't comprehend anything beyond that. It, it's logical to ask, how can this ever be? You, you almost want to stop at the end of verse 9 and say, okay, Paul, look, we love you, Paul. You're our brother. But you've just gone too far, you know? I mean, filled unto the fullness of God. Paul, calm down a little bit, you know? Maybe a little bit too much coffee. I don't know what your problem is, but just you need to calm down. You've gone a little too far. It's logical to ask how this could ever be. How could something so far above us ever become a reality? It can only happen, as it says here in verse 20, because God is able to do far beyond what we ask or think. I'll agree. According to my thinking, according to my asking, this is beyond. I'm humbled by this prayer as I read it. Because when I read this prayer that Paul prayed in verses 14 through 19, I say, I don't ask for these things for myself. I'm like, oh, Lord, please, Lord, just get me through another day. You know, these kind of small prayers. Don't you read this and then, oh, Lord Jesus, I want to be filled unto all the fullness of God. I want to know what is the height and the width and the depth and the length of the love of God. Oh, Lord, I want Jesus Christ to dwell in my heart through faith. I want to be rooted and grounded in love for my brothers and sisters. I need, according to the riches of your glory, to be strengthened by your might within the inner man. Lord, this is what I need. Not, not these small prayers, these almost insignificant prayers. God says, listen, you better get above what you can ask or think. God can do that. This doxology doesn't only belong to the prayer that precedes it, but to every glorious prayer, privilege and blessing, I should say, spoken of in the first three chapters. Who's able to bring all this to pass? Who's able to do it? Well, he is able to do it. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. You, you can ask for every good thing that you've ever experienced, God can do above that. You can think of or imagine things beyond your experience. God can do more than that. You, you can imagine good things that are beyond your ability to name. God can do above that. It's absolutely amazing. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we can ask or think. It's a super abundance in the greatest abundance. If you want to translate the literal Greek there. And then he says again, verse 20. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. God's able to do this in our life now, not just beginning with heaven. This power works in us now. And that's something absolutely staggering to think about. You know, all the things that Paul prayed for in the previous verses, the, the spiritual strength, the indwelling Jesus, the experiential knowledge of God's love, the fullness of God, they all belong to us as the children of God. But they have to be received by believing prayer. And, and you know what? They can be furthered in the lives of other people by praying for them. You know, when Paul said he prayed for these things, do you think this is just sort of like a pious exercise? No. He prayed for these things for the Ephesians because he believed God would answer such prayers. So I want you to think very carefully about that. This is something we can pray for other people as well. So the only fitting response is as it says there in verse 21. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. That's the only fitting response of this great God is to give him glory especially in the church, in the company of the redeemed, that he received that glory throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. When the church understands and when it walks in God's eternal purpose, God will be glorified and the church will fulfill its important duty of simply glorifying God. Well, I think that it's hard to get higher than the sublime things we've seen here tonight in Ephesians chapter 3. This great eternal purpose that God has, how he's using us to teach the angels, both faithful and fallen. How he's working in through us this great eternal purpose. And then finally, how he wants these things to be real in the life of the believer. Not merely for us to think about or even meditate upon, but to live on in our experience. Now, 
when we begin the next time we're together into Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is going to begin to tell these Christians how they should live. But I want you to understand, up into these glorious heights that we've been hiking in over the first three chapters, it hasn't been how to live. It's really been who you are, what you are in Jesus Christ, and the riches that God has given you in him. That is the foundation upon which your Christian life should be built. Paul has not been telling us in these first three verse chapters, I should say, do this, do that. He's going to begin with that. There's an important place in the Christian life for us to be told what to do. But our standing comes before our doing. If you have the spiritual life indicated by the first three chapters of Ephesians, then the spiritual obligations indicated by the second three chapters actually flow very easily. But let's just enjoy it. Let's enjoy the beautiful view, the thin air, the mountaintop heights here of God's glorious work for his people through his son, Jesus Christ. Father, that's our prayer. And we do believe it, that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And so we say to you, be glory in the church throughout all ages, forever and ever. You are our God. And we praise you for your goodness. We thank you for your kindness. Lord, we're amazed that you've called us to have a place in this eternal plan. And we pray that these things would be made real in our life and that you would give us a passion to pray for them to be real in the lives of other people as well. We want all your people, Lord, to know this as experiential reality, not merely as words on a page. We pray it tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.